Chapter 6 Our Minds and Other Minds Our Consciousness, Their Minds A mind looks less miraculous when one sees how it might have been put together out of parts and how it still relies on those parts. A naked human mind, without paper and pencil, without speaking, comparing notes, making sketches, is first of all something we have never seen. Every human mind you've ever looked at, including most especially your own, which you look at from the inside, is a product not just of natural selection, but of cultural redesign of enormous proportions. It's easy enough to see why a mind seems miraculous when one has no sense of all the components and of how they got made. Each component has a long design history, sometimes billions of years long. We human beings do many intelligent things unthinkingly. We brush our teeth, tie our shoes, drive our cars, and even answer questions without thinking. But most of these activities of ours are different, for we can think about them in ways that other creatures can't think about their unthinking but intelligent activities. Indeed, many of our unthinking activities, such as driving a car, could become unthinking only after passing through a long period of design development that was explicitly self-conscious. How is this accomplished? The improvements we install in our brains when we learn our languages permit us to review, recall, rehearse, redesign our own activities, turning our brains into echo chambers of sorts in which otherwise evanescent processes can hang around and become objects in their own right. Those that persist the longest, acquiring influences they persist, we call our conscious thoughts. Mental contents become conscious, not by entering some special chamber in the brain, not by being transduced into some privileged and mysterious medium, but by winning the competitions against other mental contents for domination and the control of behavior, and hence for achieving long-lasting effects, or as we misleadingly say, entering into memory. And since we are talkers, and since talking to ourselves is one of our most influential activities, one of the most effective ways for mental content to become influential is for it to get in a position to drive the language-using parts of the controls. The common reaction to this suggestion about human consciousness is frank bewilderment, expressed more or less as follows. Suppose all these strange competitive processes are going on in my brain, and suppose that, as you say, the conscious processes are simply those that win the competitions. How does that make them conscious? What happens next to them that makes it true that I know about them? For after all, it is my consciousness, as I know it from the first-person point of view, that needs explaining. Such questions betray a deep confusion, for they presuppose that what you are is something else, some Cartesian race cogitans, in addition to all this brain and body activity. What you are, however, just is this organization of all the competitive activity between a host of competences that your body has developed. You automatically know about these things going on in your body, because if you didn't, it wouldn't be your body. You could walk off with somebody else's gloves, mistakenly thinking they were your gloves, but you couldn't sign a contract with somebody else's hand, mistakenly thinking it was your hand. And you couldn't be overcome by somebody else's sadness or fear, mistakenly thinking it was your own. The acts and events you can tell us about, and the reasons for them, are yours because you made them, and because they made you. What you are is that agent whose life you can tell about. You can tell us others, and you can tell yourself. The process of self-description begins in earliest childhood, and it includes a good deal of fantasy from the outset. Think of Snoopy in the Peanuts cartoon, sitting on his doghouse and thinking, Here's the World War I ace flying into battle. It continues through life. Think of the cafe waiter in Jean-Paul Sartre's discussion of bad faith in being and nothingness who's all wrapped up in learning how to live up to his self-description as a waiter. It is what we do. It is what we are. So we have a concept of ourselves and of others. Now let's think about what concepts animals might have. Does a dog have a concept of cat? Well, yes and no. No matter how similar a dog's concept of cat is to yours as a discriminator, you and the dog discriminate exactly the same sets of entities as cats and non-cats, it differs radically in one way. The dog cannot consider its concept.
It cannot ask itself whether it knows what cats are. It cannot wonder whether cats are animals. It cannot attempt to distinguish the essence of cat by its lights from the mere accidents. Concepts are not things in the dog's world in the way that cats are things. Concepts are things in our world because we have language. A polar bear is competent vis-a-vis -vis snow in many ways that a lion is not. So in one sense, a polar bear has a concept a lion lacks, a concept of snow. But no languageless animal can have the concept of snow in the way we can because a languageless animal has no way of considering snow in general or in itself. This is not for the trivial reason that it doesn't have a natural language word for snow but because without a natural language it has no talent for wresting concepts from their interwoven connectionist nests and then manipulating them. We can speak of the polar bear's implicit or procedural knowledge of snow, the polar bear's snow how, and we can even investigate empirically the extension of the polar bear's embedded snow concept. But then bear in mind that this is not a wieldable concept for the polar bear. You may want to say, it may not be able to talk, but surely it thinks. One of the main aims of this book has been to shake your confidence in this familiar reaction. Perhaps the biggest obstacle in our attempts to get clear about the mental competences of non-human animals is our almost irresistible habit of imagining that they accompany their clever activities with a stream of reflective consciousness something like our own. It is not that we now know that they don't do any such thing, it is rather that in these early days of our investigations, we must not assume that they do. Both the philosophical and scientific thinking about this issue has been heavily influenced by the philosopher Thomas Nagel's classic 1974 paper, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? The title itself sets us off on the wrong foot, inviting us to ignore all the different ways in which bats and other animals might accomplish their cunning feats without its being like anything for them. We create a putatively impenetrable mystery for ourselves if we presume, without further ado, that Nagel's question makes sense and that we know what we are asking. What is it like for a bird to build a nest? The question invites you to imagine how you would build a nest and then to try to imagine the details of the comparison. But since nest building is not something you habitually do, you should first remind yourself of what it's like for you to do something familiar. Well, what is it like for you to tie your shoelaces? Sometimes you pay attention. Sometimes it gets done by your fingertips without any notice at all, while you think of other things. So maybe, you may think, the bird is daydreaming or plotting tomorrow's activities while it executes its constructive moves. Maybe, but in fact the evidence to date strongly suggests that the bird is not equipped to do any such thing. Indeed, the contrast you note between paying attention and doing the task while your mind was otherwise occupied probably has no counterpart at all in the case of the bird. The fact that you couldn't build a nest without thinking carefully and reflectively about what you were doing and why is not at all a good reason for assuming that when the bird builds its nest, it must think its birdish thoughts about what it is doing, at least for its first nest, before it has mastered the task. The more we learn about how brains can engage in processes that accomplish clever deeds for their non-human owners, the less these processes look like the thoughts we had dimly imagined to be doing the work. That doesn't mean that our thoughts are not processes occurring in our brains or that our thoughts are not playing the critical roles in governing our behavior that we normally assume they are. Presumably some of the processes in our own human brains will eventually be discernible as the thoughts we know so intimately but it remains to be seen whether the mental competences of any other species depend on their having mental lives the way we do. In our survey of kinds of minds and proto-minds, there does not seem to be any clear threshold or critical mass until we arrive at the sort of consciousness that we language-using human beings enjoy. That variety of mind is unique and orders of magnitude more powerful than any other variety of mind but we probably don't want to rest too much moral weight on it. Earlier, we mentioned the view that pain or suffering has been thought of as having an important moral aspect. 
As we try to tease out some conclusions from our discussions, let us use the problem of pain and suffering as an example of the qualities which might separate our human kind of mind from that of less complicated beings. We might well think that the capacity for suffering counts for more in any moral calculations than the capacity for abstruse and sophisticated reasoning about the future and everything else under the sun. What, then, is the relationship between pain, suffering, and consciousness? While the distinction between pain and suffering is, like most everyday non-scientific distinctions, somewhat blurred at the edges, it is nevertheless a valuable and intuitively satisfying mark or measure of moral importance. The phenomenon of pain is neither homogeneous across species, remember the mating monkeys, nor simple. We can see this simply in ourselves by noting how unobvious the answers are to some simple questions. Are the stimuli from our pain receptors, stimuli that prevent us from allowing our limbs to assume awkward, joint-damaging positions while we sleep, experienced as pains, or might they be properly called unconscious pains? Do they have moral significance in any case? We might call such body-protecting states of the nervous system sentient states, without thereby implying that they were the experiences of any self, any ego, any subject. For such states to matter, whether or not we call them pains or conscious states or experiences, there must be an enduring subject to whom they matter because they are a source of suffering. Consider the widely reported phenomenon of dissociation in the presence of great pain or fear. When young children are abused, they typically hit upon a desperate but effective stratagem. They leave. They somehow declare to themselves that it is not they who are suffering the pain. There seem to be two main varieties of dissociators. Those who simply reject the pain as theirs and then witness it from afar, as it were, and those who split, at least momentarily, into something like multiple personalities. I am not undergoing this pain. She is. My not entirely facetious hypothesis about this is that these two varieties of children differ in their tacit endorsement of a philosophical doctrine. Every experience must be the experience of some subject. Those children who reject the principle see nothing wrong with simply disowning the pain, leaving it subjectless to wander around hurting nobody in particular. Those who embrace the principle have to invent an altar to be the subject, anybody but me. Whether or not any such interpretation of the phenomenon of dissociation can be sustained, most psychiatrists agree that it does work to some degree. That is, whatever this psychological stunt of dissociation consists in, it is genuinely analgesic, or more precisely, whether or not it diminishes the pain, it definitely reduces suffering. So we have a modest result of sorts. The difference, whatever it is, between a non-dissociated child and a dissociated child is a difference that markedly affects the existence or amount of suffering. I hasten to add that nothing I have said implies that when children dissociate, they in any way mitigate the atrocity of the vile behavior of their abusers. They do, however, dramatically diminish the awfulness of the effects themselves, though such children may pay a severe price later in life in dealing with the after-effects of their dissociation. A dissociated child does not suffer as much as a non-dissociated child. But now what should we say about creatures that are naturally dissociated, that never achieve or even attempt to achieve the sort of complex internal organization that is standard in a normal child and disrupted in a dissociated child? An invited conclusion would be... Such a creature is constitutionally incapable of undergoing the sort or amount of suffering that a normal human can undergo. But if all non-human species are in such a relatively disorganized state, we have grounds for the hypothesis that non-human animals may indeed feel pain but cannot suffer the way we can. How convenient! Animal lovers can be expected to respond to the suggestion with righteous indignation and deep suspicion, since it does indeed promise to allay many of our misgivings about common human practices, absolving our hunters and farmers and experimenters of at least some of the burden of guilt that others would place on their shoulders. We should be particularly cautious and even-handed in considering the grounds for it. We should be on the lookout for sources of illusion on both sides of this stormy issue.
The suggestion that non-human animals are not susceptible to human levels of suffering typically provokes a flood of heart-wrenching stories, mostly about dogs. Why do dogs predominate? Could it be that dogs make the best counterexamples because dogs actually do have a greater capacity for suffering than other mammals? It could be. And the evolutionary perspective we've been pursuing can explain why. Dogs, and only dogs among domesticated species, respond strongly to the enormous volume of what we might call humanizing behavior aimed at them by their owners. We talk to our dogs, commiserate with our dogs, and in general treat them as much like a human companion as we can, and we delight in their familiar and positive response to this friendliness. We may try it with cats, but it seldom seems to take. This is not surprising in retrospect. Domestic dogs are the descendants of social mammals and over millions of years living in cooperative, highly interactive groups, while domestic cats spring from asocial lineages. Moreover, domestic dogs are importantly unlike their cousins, the wolves and foxes and coyotes, in their responsiveness to human affection. There is no mystery about why this should be so. Domestic dogs have been selected for just these differences for hundreds of thousands of generations. In The Origin of Species, Charles Darwin pointed out that whereas deliberate human intervention in the reproduction of domesticated species has worked for several thousand years to breed faster horses, woollier sheep, beefier cattle, and so forth, a more subtle but still powerful force has been at work for a much longer time shaping our domesticated species. He called it unconscious selection. Our ancestors engaged in selective breeding, but they didn't think they were doing so. This unwitting favoritism over the eons has made our dogs more and more like us in ways that appeal to us. Among other traits we have unconsciously selected for, I suggest, is susceptibility to human socializing, which has in dogs many of the organizing effects that human socializing also has on human infants. By treating them as if they were human, we actually succeed in making them more human than they otherwise would be. They begin to develop the very organizational features that are otherwise the sole province of socialized human beings. In short, if human consciousness, the sort of consciousness that is a necessary condition for serious suffering, is, as I have maintained, a radical restructuring of the virtual architecture of the human brain, then it should follow that the only animals that would be capable of anything remotely like that form of consciousness would be animals that could also have imposed on them, by culture, that virtual machine. Dogs are clearly closest to meeting this condition. What about pain? When I step on your toe, causing a brief but definite and definitely conscious pain, I do you scant harm, typically none at all. The pain, though intense, is too brief to matter, and I have done no long-term damage to your foot. The idea that you suffer for a second or two is a risible misapplication of that important notion. And even when we grant that my causing you a few seconds of pain may irritate you for a few seconds or even minutes more, especially if you think I did it deliberately, the pain itself, as a brief, negatively signed experience, is of vanishing moral significance. If in stepping on your toe I have interrupted your singing of the aria, thereby ruining your operatic career, that is quite another matter. Many discussions seem to assume tacitly, one, that suffering and pain are the same thing on a different scale, two, that all pain is experienced pain, and three, that the amount of suffering is to be calculated in principle just by adding up all the pains, the awfulness of which is determined by duration times intensity. These assumptions looked at dispassionately in the cold light of day, a difficult feat for some partisans, are ludicrous. A little exercise may help. Suppose, thanks to some miracle of modern medicine, you could detach all your pain and suffering from the contexts in which it occurred postponing it all, say, to the end of the year, when it could be endured in one horrible week of unremitting agony, a sort of negative vacation, or, if the formula of Assumption 3 is to be taken seriously, trading off duration for intensity, so that a year's misery could be packed into one excruciating lump-sum jolt lasting, say, five minutes. A whole year without so much as a mild annoyance or headache in exchange for a brief and entirely reversible descent into hell without anesthesia. Would you accept such a bargain? 
I certainly would if I thought it made sense. We are assuming, of course, that this horrible episode would not kill me or render me insane in the aftermath, though I'd be quite happy to be insane during the jolt itself. In fact, I'd gladly take the bargain, even if it meant doubling or quadrupling the total amount of suffering, just as long as it would all be over in five minutes and leave no lasting debilities. I expect anybody would be happy to make such a deal, but it really doesn't make any sense. It would imply, for instance, that the benefactor who provided such a service gratis to all would, ex hypothesi, double or quadruple the world's suffering, and the world would love him for it. What's wrong with this scenario is, of course, that you can't detach pain and suffering from their contexts in the imagined way. The anticipation and aftermath and the recognition of the implications for one's life plans and prospects cannot be set aside as the merely cognitive accompaniments of the suffering. What is awful about losing your job or your leg or your reputation or your loved one is not the suffering this event causes in you, but the suffering this event is. If we are concerned to discover and ameliorate unacknowledged instances of suffering in the world, we need to study creatures' lives, not their brains. What happens in their brains is, of course, highly relevant as a rich source of evidence about what they are doing and how they do it. But what they are doing is, in the end, just as visible to a trained observer as the activities of plants, mountain streams, or internal combustion engines. If we fail to find suffering in the lives we can see, studying them diligently, using all the methods of science, we can rest assured that there is no invisible suffering somewhere in their brains. If we find suffering, we will recognize it without difficulty. It is all too familiar. This book began with a host of questions, and, since this is a book by a philosopher, it ends not with the answers, but, I hope, with better versions of the questions themselves. At least we can see some paths to pursue and some traps to avoid in our ongoing exploration of the different kinds of minds. The different kinds of minds. The different kinds of minds.